Good afternoon. This is Kathy Neifeld, one of the four partners at Agency One. Together with Ed Lesher, Dennis Bartos, and Gonzalo Garcia, I am honored to welcome you to the final session of the 2020 Agency One Annual, and we hope for this year only, virtual advisor conference. Thank you for joining us. For those of you who have joined us over the past month, we hope you found value from the speakers and the content that was shared. Throughout the month of October, Agency One has, has hosted over 21 hour sessions on a variety of topics, including practice management, tax policy, the economy, estate planning with high net worth clients, sales opportunities, some that are general and others that highlight a specific product, charitable planning opportunities, how you can become a shareholder in an agent owned reinsurance company, opportunities for wealth managers that are looking for a fee-based alternative to the more traditional life insurance sales process and much, much more. We have featured nationally recognized speakers, including estate planning attorneys, Ed Wren from Withers Bergman and David York from York, Hal and Guyman, New York Times bestselling authors and inspirational speakers, Ben Nempton, Tim Arnold from StoryBrand and Kim Lear from Inlay Insights, economic and legislative updates, product specialists, sales ideas, an underwriting update featuring our very own Dennis Bartos and Jessica Karakoff, in addition to the chief underwriter from Lincoln Financial Group, Jordan Carrera, and Nicole Meyer from Swiss Re and our very own Gonzalo Garcia, just to name a few. All of the sessions that have taken place have been recorded and can be accessed by you through the attendee hub. I know that many of you that are joining us today have participated in the conference over the last three weeks, but we do have a number of new advisors as our speaker and topic has generated significant interest. I would be remiss if I did not take this opportunity for the advisors that are participating for the first time to introduce Agency One and provide an abbreviated history of Agency One and how we got to where we are today. For those of you that have heard this before, please indulge me. The principles of Agency One have been working together for more than 30 years, always in the life insurance brokerage space. We love what we do and we love working with the advisors that are part of our Agency One 100 group. One of the tenants or basic value propositions that is central to our Agency One offering is providing educational content, networking opportunities, and idea sharing with our advisors. Over the past month, we hope we have succeeded in providing this to you in this virtual format. If you would like to learn more about Agency One, we hope you will reach out to us. Once again, the entire meeting has been hosted through an attendee hub where you have access to the entire agenda, live streams, and all of the sessions have been recorded for you to review. Now, before I introduce our final speaker and last session, I do have a couple of housekeeping items. We were supposed to announce the winners of the idea sharing contest this afternoon. Unfortunately, a technical glitch has interfered with the ballots. I know, I cannot make this up. If you attended the session yesterday, you received an email from me earlier today asking that you again vote. Please respond to me with an email before five o'clock Eastern time today with the advisor that you think presented the best idea. If you would like to participate and did not watch the session live, it has been recorded and can be viewed through the attendee hub. Just send me your choice before five o'clock this afternoon and your vote will count. We will announce the winners tomorrow via email. Now, on to the session. All attendees will be on mute. Please submit your questions through the chat function. We will address them either during the presentation or at the end, depending upon the question. This will be your final opportunity to ask questions. Once again, the session is being recorded and a link to the recording will be made available after this session. And please do not forget to complete your session survey 
after this final session. Now, let's move on to the session. Our next speaker is Bill Bynan. Bill is president and CEO of Capital Wealth Advisors, which is an estate financial planning and wealth advisory firm. As president and CEO of Capital Wealth Advisors, Bill is dedicated to building client relationships marked by communication, commitment, and a keen ability to clarify complex decisions. A highly skilled professional with extensive industry insight, Bill has spent the past five years of his practice focusing specifically in the areas of wealth preservation and premium finance. This direction affords him the opportunity to work closely with clients as they seek to protect, enhance, and enjoy their personal prosperity. Bill's, Bill's career began more than 15 years ago as an agent for a major life insurance carrier where he trained in their advanced planning, de planning department Later, he served as the director of estate planning for Creative Asset Services in Pittsburgh. In 1998, Bill joined First Financial Resources in Naples, Florida as the marketing director and ultimately as a partner. After founding Capital Wealth Advisors in 2004, Bill strategically expanded his practice in 2005 by partnering with independent agents throughout the country to assist them in growing their businesses through proprietary premium finance and wealth preservation programs. But aside from that phenomenal resume, I am also proud to say that Bill is also a lot of fun and a really good friend. Bill is going to discuss new planning opportunities available in this changing economic, political, and legislative landscape. Bill, I am now gonna turn this over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. And as always, it's it's great to participate with Agency One in this annual conference. Uh, I, I do miss the opportunity to be with everyone and uh, specifically uh, sharing a bourbon at the end of the afternoon uh, after I speak, which is a tradition. Um, but but I've really enjoyed, um, you know, Agency One did a wonderful job pivoting to online and I've really enjoyed the opportunities that we have seen through the past uh, month uh, from the speakers uh, from from Ben's initial opening uh, with uh, sort of the things you wanna do before you die through the why of estate plan that David York presented on and, and sort of the updates from, from the other speakers and then opportunities that we have in practice of development, personal development, I think have just been wonderful. And I hope today kind of ties a bow around that in looking at where we are um, in our world with regard to all the change around us. Um, uh, I'm gonna spend a lot of time kind of going through sort of sort of point counterpoint on on where we are from a potential change perspective and how that may provide an opportunity for our clients and ultimately for our practice um, but before we sort of kick off uh, i've been at this a long time almost 25 years now um, my, my practice has evolved uh, just as i'm sure many of yours have um, i was in that same role if you go back to the session around financial uh, and wealth advisory aspects of in our in our practice uh, in 2013, we added wealth management, which has become the sort of largest part of the practice today. Uh, it's actually about 1.8 billion of assets under management, but but our roots have really always been in planning. Um, so so every time I'm working with a family, I'm focused primarily on the planning and how we we manage their wealth and execute on their planning to meet their their goals. So uh, today, I lead a team of about 48 people, uh, headquartered in Naples, Florida. Uh, and um, luckily, um, we have had uh, a little bit of an easier time than living in a high rise in New York City or Philadelphia for Kathy. Um, so we get outside during COVID, but it's still been challenging times. So we've all had to adapt in, in spending time to our clients. Uh, I joked the other day with one of my clients in that our interaction has actually uh, increased, I would say, tenfold with our clients because they're at home and they're reading and they're watching the news and it's developing uh, questions that lead to conversations about their personal planning, about sort of the discussion about where we're going uh, in the world. Um, so we're gonna talk today um, about the potential tax law changes and how that impacts estates and families. The, the general tax implications uh, of the election from perspective, I know we've heard a lot about this uh, throughout the last month. I'm gonna try to sort of recap some of that and give, give our opinions of how we apply that to the work that we, we uh, do with our families. Um, we're gonna talk about unified credit planning in today's world, IRA planning, which I think um, 
uh, is something that's become a, a very, very hot topic, uh, at least in our in our practice. And then what we should be thinking about as as we have clarity on the election and, and what considerations should be um, could be considered. What, what should we do at the year end and, and how do we, we play along with that? Um, I'm going to do it a little different than some of the other speakers. Uh, I would encourage you. Uh, to ask questions along the way. Uh, Gonzalo and Kathy will interrupt and, and to the extent that we can answer them along the way uh, on a specific topic, I'm happy to do that. Uh, there'll be questions at the end, there'll be time at the end. And if um, we'll provide my email, if you have follow-up questions after the fact, I, I love uh, collaborating and, and visiting with, with uh, colleagues around the country. I'm happy to, to share my ideas. That's, that's a big part of, of the culture of Agency One is getting together, sharing ideas, helping each other grow our practices. So that's that's really my my goal for today, and I'm I'm happy that you're here to uh, spend some time with us. Um, so the big thing that we're talking about, you know, just a few days ahead, if you if you haven't been buried in the sand, you you hear about the election every eight seconds, all day, every day, starting from the time you wake up and turn on the television. So we've got two very different uh, approaches and 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 perspectives from the two presidential candidates and you know, I, I look at it in a way that we're going to have change regardless of who the president is and we have opportunities for our clients. So I thought maybe I'd start by highlighting some things that uh, Joe Biden has put up because his his proposal would be the largest amount of change. Um, unlike many candidates, he's actually published a white paper on his website uh, that gives you very specific details to what um, uh, what he's thinking about from a, from a proposed uh, proposed tax plan in, in his administration and what that would look like. So, I, I want to go through that and then we'll we'll draw some dynamics and, and think about how that has an effect on on uh, our clients and our families. So, big picture, uh, roll back the the income uh, tax relief from 2017, reinstate 39.6 for top rate earners increase the capital gains tax and then sort of put a put a bump on that the, the maximum bracket and capital gains under his proposal will be 39.6 and that would apply to uh, gains of a million or more by by an individual or family during a calendar year that would put you in that top bracket we're going to talk about how that has an impact on the states as we as we go on further he wants to increase corporate tax rates to 28 percent provide an unlimited 12.4% cap on social security for income earners of 400,000 or more. Um, wants to reinstate, good good thing in the plan, wants to reinstate the, the uh, itemize the deductions on state and local property tax and mortgage interest. Uh, so I think many people around the country would be happy with that. Uh, initially his plan said he wanted to cut the estate uh, unified credit exemption in half. Uh, that has been since revised. Uh, so the plan is to, to trim it back to three and a half million, which is what we had several years ago. And then also in, increase the rate to 55% from 40%. Um, one fundamental change that that from a from the code that he's talking about is also eliminating the step up in basis or the basis reset, where uh, you can inherit assets and and have a new basis based on the date of death of the original uh, decedent. Um, the the plan uh, a few years ago they talked about that under his uh, vice presidential. Um, time period, but at that point they talked about eliminating but applying the tax upon the sale of the asset. Under the new plan, the idea is to uh, to impose that tax, but upon the transfers. It's almost a second transfer tax, a little more closely aligned to the Canadian system. Um, but when you couple that with the idea that if you have a million dollars of capital gains in one year, putting the rate at 39.6, it's really a second substantial transfer tax for the majority of families that, that we work with. So it's something we're watching very closely and we've actually started to proactively go through and look at cost basis of assets for our families. And we'll, we'll dig into that a little more. But I think the point is that regardless of political affiliation, regardless of who we're voting for or who wins, there's going to be change. Uh, we think that Biden's plan will have sort of a larger impact because he's proposing more change. Uh, but that doesn't mean that if Donald Trump continues to be or is reelected, that that there won't be changes during the next four years under his administration. So the the idea is we live in a world of change. Uh, lately, it's been a little more uh, robust. But um, in my career of doing this for over 25 years, uh, things have uh, have constantly changed, and we have to pivot as advisors uh, and to our families to make sure that we're taking advantage of as much of that as we can. And finding opportunity where we can in that. Oops, sorry about that. Let me click this way. 
So this is just a graph kind of showing the differentials between the two. Um, again, the big ones are going to be corporate income and capital gains and taxes on dividends. So you can see those and how that looks from that perspective. So when I think about what's going on, I'm thinking about kind of a triple threat. You know, when you think about it, we're going to lower the threshold uh, for families to be subjected by an estate tax. We're going to raise uh, potentially in this proposal the rate back to 55 percent. Uh, and then we eliminate the step up in basis, but then you throw the, the third, the kicker of that million dollar rate, you, you could potentially subject a, a pretty substantial amount of your state to a second, basically 40% tax. So, and one of the things that's not talked about a lot is especially around the, um, the uh, step up in basis elimination, it's dramatically going to increase uh, the cost to administer estates. Imagine having to go back and track basis um, uh, for a number of years and assets that have been held, real estate, whatever that may be. So we also have to factor in that there's going to be frictional costs associated with just the administration uh, of these. And, and then so as we look for our families, you know, there may be some proactive things that we'd recommend that we'll talk about uh, at the end of the year uh, to avoid that. So again, just to kind of recap, uh, things we're worried about from the estate planning perspective, unified credit, what happens there. Um, but one of the things I think it's important to put out, the unified credit is scheduled to sunset uh, under current form and reduce in half under the current administration, under the current law. So in some ways, it won't matter who the president is. It's really going to depend on who the, how the Congress plays out because they may or may not have enough votes to continue. And even if President Trump were to win re-election, we may not be able to extend those tax benefits under the current law. So it's going to more than likely change regardless of who the president is. So good, good opportunity to use that this year um, while, while we have it. Um, so that's certainly uh, something to think about. The step on basis we've talked about, you know, as we summarized, very important to think about. And then how are capital gains tax when you pile that in and you're doing the impact of the family's estate plan, you need to look at those uh, as, as uh, potential risks for them. So again, tax implications, we're gonna have them regardless of whether or not uh, President Trump or Joe Biden get in. We're living in this world of changes. You throw the idea of global economic stimulus, uh, the central banks have had record stimulus, record um, injection of cash into the global economies. Um, at some point, those have to be paid for. At some point, that could be inflationary. So there are a variety of things that are going to shift our economic policy over the next decade. Uh, not just because of elections, but also because of the environment we're living in with a global pandem pandemic and the cost and effect that we've had that on our economy. So very important to, to keep that in mind. Um, we try not, I try not to make uh, our, our discussions political. It, it's again, the world we're living in, we wanna make sure that we're, we're, we're educating our clients. Um, and you know, even though things change, many things stay the same. So regardless of the tax rate, regardless of the unified credit rate, families that are, that are engaged uh, in planning that are affected by those, um, you know, it's going to change the numbers, but it's not going to change. It's, it's not, we're not going to see a period of time, I think in my lifetime, where it just goes away. So, so keep in mind some of those tried and true things that we've talked about over the years still work. We'll continue to work. Life insurance as, as an opportunity, I think, will become more important in planning. Um, than it ever has been because we're going to potentially have this this tax change, but but many of the things that we've used in our careers will continue to work uh, and hopefully be uh, valuable to the families that we we advise. Um, so we think about things that you know the the estate tax. So this is a chart of the the exemption and the top rate. So you can kind of see, you know, the exemption. If we look over here in the in the in the side here of of, of up through last year. Obviously, we had a, a much higher exemption that historically is very high. Um, uh, we've had obviously rate changes on, in the blue line that's coming across. Um, so again, the, the, the proposal is to kind of take these two, uh, these last two bars, bring them down substantially lower, and then raise this blue line up to an historical number of 55%. But you'll see that we've had this sort of structure in for a very long time. We know that under the current, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sunset in half. Um, but what that'll do, don't forget though, that there is an, there is an index uh, for inflation on that. So I, I read a projection the other day that if it, if it goes to 2025 and sunsets with indexing, that would equate to about a six and a half million dollar credit. 
So as you're thinking about with your families and you're projecting, that might mean uh, uh, be an important thing to, to consider to think about as you're looking at, at gifting opportunities. So from an estate planning standpoint, and I don't think I'm saying anything new, but the things that we should be thinking about uh, and, and what should we be taking advantage of. Uh, I, I always use the term use it or lose it. Um, we want to consider for families that have the ability to make gifts, use the unified credit now, locking it in uh, before either the current tax law sunsets or if it's going to be accelerated under a Biden administration with congressional uh, favorability, you may want to consider using it sooner. But either way, our recommendation is for the families to use it. We may be accelerating that to say year end 2020. And I'm, uh, we'll talk about a new type of trust planning that enables us to do some creative things around locking that in. Um, we know that if they use it, the Supreme Court's opined that uh, they can't take it back retroactively. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that if we do have a, a political change, um, typically what will happen is if they adjust the law by the end of the year next year, so in 2021, uh, they typically do make it retroactive back to January 1 of that current year. So uh, you can't wait till January to make the, make the trans transfers in the event that we think we're going to have some, some legal action or, or change in the law during the year. Uh, if we have uh, a situation where we think the, the capital gains uh, step on basis goes away, um, as I said, we're already analyzing client portfolios. We're looking at client assets. It may be a good time to consider selling assets and by the end of the year, locking in a lower rate. We're, we're gonna see at a minimum a 28% um, increase. 28% in, uh, would be the new rate for capital gains. And again, 39.6 for over a million. So there's some, there's some income and in, in tax planning. Um, we have a number of families that have been holding assets because uh, the clients are, are, are very elderly. Uh, with very low basis, um, but you know that that's something we'd have to reconsider along the way because if the step up goes away, it's, it's it might be better to lock in a lower a lower rate today. Um, review your IRA and beneficiary designations. Consider Roth conversion. I'm going to talk a little bit later about a, a leveraged IRA plan. Um, we know that, and I'm going to talk about this, but the Secure Act actually happened in the Trump administration had a number of uh, of structural changes to IRA planning. Uh, we couple that with potential tax issues um, and tax changes, and it, it really uh, is something that we think is a, a, a top of mind topic to, to review with your clients in, in today. Uh, no need to wait on that. And then lastly, you know, take advantage of historically low rates. I mean, interest rates are very low. I think if you look at the yield curves and you look at the, the forward projections on, on interest rates in the markets, they're going to be lower for longer. Lock those in, consider doing intrafamily lending, consider doing sales to defective trust, things to shift the growth of the estate uh, off the taxable page. Um, and we're at an historically low, low rate time for that. So something to consider as, as you are, are working with your families. So one of the things with the unified credit, as I said, under current administration, it's gonna sunset. We're gonna see a pretty substantial change uh, under current law, basically taking that in half. Uh, and we have a potential of three and a half. So how do we, how do we look at unified credit um, gifting? And many families that I've worked with over the years will say, I'll say, Bill, I, I love the idea of locking in my credit, but I don't wanna be in a situation where someday I need that money. And if I give it away, I won't have any access to it. So over the years, uh, you know, especially in 2012, when we had a similar sort of uh, challenge facing us with the credit changing, we, we did a lot of work in spousal gifting using spousal lifetime access trust or SLATs. Um, those are great. There's some nuance to them that, that families liked, but the issue was is that if I funded a trust for the benefit of my wife um, and, and, I, uh, and she predeceased me, those assets weren't available to me. So uh, through the years, we've, we've been able to work uh, with a very close uh, friend of mine, a lawyer has developed something called a SPAT. And it's basically a lifetime access trust with a special provision that I'm about talking about now. Um, you know, we think about it, you know, how do we give it away and keep a string on it for safety purposes? The SLATs worked really well, but there were certain circumstances where you had to plan for uh, the, the assets going away for one of the spouses, depending on who passed first. So when we look at slots, they, they work great. They make a lot of sense. It's a great way to lock in the unified credit. So if I think about this, if I have 
uh, I have a husband and wife, I can give each other's unified credit to a trust for each other's benefit. Now the trust can't be identical because the, we would have a mere trust doctrine issue, but it gives us the ability in, in to, to give them away and lock in a credit. Um, and then the assets of the growth that they have are gonna be out of the estate. And if the credit is reduced, we've locked that in. I think Kathy may have a question. I, she's popped up on my screen. I do, uh, Bill, thanks. So before we get too far down the path, a question that came in was, uh, could you please clarify leveraged RIA, uh, IRA planning? Yeah, I'm going to uh, end with leveraged IRA planning in a very detailed way. So you're gonna to get to see how we make the sausage. But basically, before we get there, I'll give you a little teaser. Uh, IRA maximization or leveraged IRA planning is, is utilizing life insurance to take an IRA and maximize the benefit um, for children and or grandchildren depending on the planning. I'm gonna go through a real client example at the end of the presentation. Um, and then we did get another comment, I guess, which is what if you have a spat with your spouse? Oh yes, that's always a question. So the, the acronym, uh, so if we have a spat or an argument while owning a spat, and it's funny, Kathy, that you mentioned that because uh, we were implementing this for one of our families the other day and they were doing cross gifting and long marriage, but it started as a joke, but then ended up in a substantive conversation. You can, you can um, create almost, for lack of a better description, an nuptial agreement or an asset split agreement before you make the gifts so that um, if you get in an argument, one spouse can't take their trust and run, you know, you can, you can set that up through agreement separately. Um, and many families are doing that now, but uh, they use the same joke, uh, but then the conversation got serious where the husband looked at his wife and said, well, you're not planning on taking the trust, are you? <laughs> so, yeah. but yeah, you can, you can structure around that. Uh, so. uh, thank you, Bill. I'm gonna thank go you. off, but I'm gonna remind everyone, please ask questions uh, through the um, chat function in the, attendee hub and uh, we will address them. Thank you. Sure, thanks. So, so as we go through this again, um, I, in this example, I'm making, I'm creating a trust for the benefit of my wife. She's creating a trust for the benefit of me. We are crossing those assets. So the trust of which my wife created for my benefit, she's the grantor. I'm the primary uh, initial beneficiary. So I can access my half of the balance sheet in my trust. My wife in, in, in reverse can do the same. Um, but the issue was, is that if I created this trust for the benefit of my wife and God forbid she, she passed uh, unexpectedly early in the original structure, this 11.58 million and whatever it had grown to would go down to the beneficiaries and I would have lost access to that. And I'm going to talk to you how we, how we fix that in a spat in a moment. So the spouses can be the, the trustees um, of each other's trusts and ultimately go to the children and the grandchildren. This is also a great way to structure uh, insurance holdings for younger couples. So as an example, all of my individual life insurance that I have that is really there for, for asset and income replacement for my wife and daughter is in a spouse like this. So my wife is the primary beneficiary and trustee. My daughter is, is the secondary uh, beneficiary. So it, this same type of trust planning can also work uh, at varying ages of estate development for your family. So don't think of it just as a way for unified credit. Think of it as a, as a way to, to utilize an insurance planning as well. And I think it works really, really well. So again, you make the 11.58% or million dollar gift. That is the use of the credit, which is not taxed, but it's all that growth over a lifetime that's out. Um, Bill, while you're talking about setting up these trusts, a question did come in, uh, which was, can you clarify the reciprocal trust doctrine issue? Yes. Um, so the IRS and through a variety of court cases has said, and you hear the reciprocal trust or mirrored trust doctrine. It basically says that if Kathy and I were married and we had identical trusts with identical terms and, and we, we did cross gifting to each other, that the IRS would basically deem that as though we didn't make the gift. Um, so the way that you get around that and it's been done in practice that I've seen many law firms, they will make the trusts, although it would have the same ultimate goals, but will have different provisions to make them different enough that, uh, that they can't be deemed to be mere trust to each other, thus uh, getting sort of eliminated from the plan. So just something, and, 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 and I would say that um, it's something that every estate planning lawyer knows, uh, very, very common practice to do it that way. 
So just if you end up with them that are identical, I would raise that question. Um, so how do we get around that risk of, uh, sorry about that. How do we get around the risk of my wife dying early and me losing the access to that? So a special power of appointment is something to be written in the document and that power can be given to somebody uh, that gives them the ability to, to act uh, in the trust on behalf of, of someone and the beneficiary. So because these trusts, in a, when, we, when we convert it or we, we tweak it and make it a spat, we take away what we call the testamentary power of appointment. And that literally is the ability for the, for the surviving spouse to make a change themselves. And we create a special power of appointment in that trust. And that power of appointment is a lifetime power of appointment and it's provided to an independent third party. So your, your attorney, non-family member, your CPA, somebody unrelated to the family. So in that example, what we use it for in this example is if, if again, I created that trust for my wife and she ultimately or died prior to me, rather than trust immediately going downstream to the beneficiaries, the trust is held until my subsequent death and the independent power holder has the ability either through loans or special distributions out of that trust can provide money back to me as the surviving spouse. Even though it is a completed gift for estate purposes, the special power appointment allows that to happen. Now, um, with everything, uh, you have to be uh, careful on how that, how that is executed. Um, certainly, you wouldn't want to be taking monthly distributions out of the trust from the, from the, the, the uh, power appointment holder. You want it to be regular. So, so typically, you would, um, you would say, okay, what's the budget for the next three years? And they would, they would do a one-time distribution or they would do periodic loans out so that it wasn't looked at as though it was income. So the way I say it to our families, the way I explain it is, it kind of gives you uh, a safety net because we'd want you to spend down the assets that are in the estate, but God forbid you'd ever need them. We have a way now to do cross gifting between spouses and then enable sort of a safety net to get access to that money. So I think uh, a great, great opportunity uh, as, you, as you're working with your families, especially as we're taking advantage of this gifting opportunity at the end of this year, this is and what we're finding that this is a preferred method that we're, we're using. Bill, another question came in while we're uh, on this topic, which was, is there a possible way to decant an islet and move that into the slat? Um, it will depend on the state uh, and the governing law. Um, and uh, it would also depend on the grantors. <clears throat> there are, the answer is, depending on the state that you live in, depending on the, the situs of the trust, uh, there are many of the states have added decanting provisions. You can also, um, in the event that you don't have a decanting provision, we have taken uh, some through, uh, through the court. The courts in some scenarios will allow you to do a non-judicial modification and, and accomplish the same thing. If you have a recitus provision, states like South Dakota that have uh, a large number of trust companies, they've got very flexible rules around decanting. Uh, Tennessee is another one. So, so I would I would look at the original trust to determine where it was situs, does it have resiting provisions, and then sort of build a plan from there. Um, but obviously the first and easiest is if it's in a state where decanting is uh, in the statute, it's really simple. Um, and it's a great way to adjust trust uh, over time. So I would certainly look into that. So one of my, one of my favorite clients uh, is a young, younger, retired professional athlete, very, very, very successful. And um, his motto is nothing spends like cash. So one of the things we say we're in constant state of change with some things stay the same, you know, cash is cash. And when we're settling the state, when we're looking at our, our asset base, um, how do we create or how do we identify enough liquidity to pay the estate tax? And how do we do the same now that we're potentially going to have to have, you know, a, maybe a second tax with the capital gains tax? We, do we have enough liquidity so we don't have forced sales, things of that nature? So I, I want to take you through sort of a, a tried and true old discussion that we've had about liquidity planning. Uh, I've always said, and I, I think I've talked about this, Kathy and I have, have presented this a couple of times, but in today's world, sometimes it's not about the tax, it's about the liquidity. And, and it's something that I feel that 
many advisors uh, to their families sort of um, don't focus on it enough. I also think it's as, as insurance professionals, it is a great opportunity to create solutions and drive uh, insurance production in our practices because it, it really makes sense for the families. Um, so as I go through this, it'll, it'll kind of become clear. Um, this is an oldie but a goodie, but again, it goes to that thought process that even though we're in this big world of change, some things don't change. Um, some things actually get worse. So, uh, you know, clients will often say, my kids can live on half. I'm good with that. That's great if you can create enough liquidity to pay the tax. Um, you know, uh, will it result in them getting half? Um, and many times the answer is no. As I, as I think back, you know, uh, in 2016, WealthX, uh, which is a great, great resource, by the way, if you haven't uh, had an opportunity to, to look at WealthX, um, they do a lot of studies, a lot of benchmarking, a lot of work. And in 2016, they did a study. And what was interesting, they said that of the ultra high net worth families uh, that have reached the age of 80 or older, the average liquidity in their estate is only 34% and it is declining um, over the lifetime, which if you think about it logically makes kind of sense because you get to a certain point, you're spending your liquid assets, your fixed assets, your real estate assets are are, are appreciating, but those aren't, aren't getting spent down. So we have to think about that when we have estates that have large, potentially now up to a 55% estate tax, up to a you know a 39.6% capital gains on embedded gain on top of that. So liquidity is key uh, to, to that. Timing can be everything and or it can be the worst thing to happen to you. So I, I've often told this story is that um, we talk about a client, it was, it was the father of a client of mine, successful entrepreneur, very, very, very large estate, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, if not just up to, up to a billion. Uh, he was divorced, unmarried, had a couple kids. Um, and his, his plan was, listen, my kids are going to get more after the estate tax than I ever started with. Um, he was self-made. And um, so his plan was literally do nothing, let the kids pay the tax and, and move on down the road. Um, the problem was, is he passed away unexpectedly in December of 07. So if we think about that in the context of the beginnings or, or the sort of the, the, the right before the financial crisis started. So think about nine months from December of 07 when the tax was due, where we were in a global economy at that point. We had um, a financial crisis, no asset class was immune to it, it massively declining valuations. And in his case, the tax was due, not only in the United States, but another tax due in France, uh, and nine months from the date. So August of 08 couldn't have been a, a worse time. So the other problem was, is that he was a developer entrepreneur. He had 80% of his net worth in the liquid assets, commercial and residential real estate, as well as art. Um, and much of the real estate, I would say three quarters of real estate was in Manhattan. And there was some outside the US and some in South Florida and Miami. So you think about those real estate markets. So now I've got to liquidate assets to pay an estate tax at arguably the worst time in, in global history to do so. So be thinking about that timing, telling clients that story if they if they want to have a discussion around, you know, doing nothing and just saying the kids will be fine. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be. In addition to that, um, you we started to really after this after this event uh, took place it caused us to really look also at sort of the carry cost of the time between death and the estate tax being the estate being settled. Uh, in his case, again, crazy entrepreneur, he had 13 homes uh, in six different countries. You know, he, he had, he had collectibles. He had, he had 55 personal staff that worked for him. And so the, the, as this estate was getting settled, there was also the liquidity that was there was getting chewed up. Uh, by the carry cost. Um, so you think about that as you're thinking about an estate settlement as well. I think it's really important. So at the end of the day, that family um, lost about 80 cents on the dollar um, because they had to sell assets at a horrible time. Surprisingly, the art assets were the savior because you couldn't borrow money on a house. You couldn't borrow money on a plane or a boat, but you could, they'd lend you money on art. So they leveraged the money uh, with a very large, with Deutsche Bank, they lent them the money, it got them through, but the kids, the kids, no one's throwing them a pity party, they end up with a lot of money, but they, they lost an enormous amount of money. Had we been in a situation where we had a capital gains tax on top of that, 
we, we probably would have lost another 15% of the estate uh, in value on a net net basis, you know, based on what the embedded gains were. So, and imagine if we had a lower exemption, you know, even though the exemption was lower there, but like, think about it in today's context, you have bad timing, you have illiquidity, you've got an issue where you potentially have more, a second layer of tax, all of these things um, sort of point to a need to have sort of a secure bucket of liquidity. We love using insurance in this scenario so that we know that we have enough to pay the tax. We also know that we have enough to cover the carry cost and we look at that with families. Uh, if any of you have used uh, any of in Innsmark's product, their product Wealthy and Wise does a great job of analyzing liquidity of an estate. Uh, so you can see in any given year if you have a deficiency it's a great way to sell life insurance and that life insurance really benefits the families uh, if they have it in there. So um, really a great opportunity to have conversations with your family. And again, not that this is a new, new concept, it's an old concept, but it's something that's going to sort of be uh, enhanced as the credits change, as the taxes increase on estates, it makes it even more important as we, as we go along. Um, so one of the things that we look for when we're talking about liquidity, I look for concentration of illiquid assets, real estate, operating companies, private equity is one that was really interesting. So during this estate settlement, the estate was still getting capital calls on private equity um, investments, hedge funds without death redemptions. So if you think about in this case, what happened to a lot of hedge funds during the financial crisis, they put the gates up, couldn't do a redemption. Um, so, so that made something that may on paper have looked somewhat liquid to illiquid. Retirement assets, 401k assets, tax deferred annuities, things of like that deferred comp, they're liquid, but they're not because if you liquidate them, you have to pay an income tax. So when we think about that, I, I kind of put those in a liquid, but not really category. And then things in the estate plan that can complicate it. Do we have direct cash bequests? Um, if, you, if you looked at uh, James Gandolfini's estate, read about that, he had designed his estate to take the cash and give it to family members and basically and by mistake left the estate tax obligation and the illiquid assets to his to his surviving spouse so looking at how the estate plan is structured is important how are we going to transfer close to hill businesses do we have buy sell agreements in place Do we have those funded even if it's intra-family i think it's important to consider um, do we have blended families second second marriages does that complicate where the liquidity goes and then Again, in today's world, we need to look for assets uh, with embedded capital gains. We'll, we'll know whether that's going to be a hot topic here in a, in a week or so, um, maybe. And um, so, so again, those are, those are things to think about when we're talking about liquidity. Um, the biggest topic and sort of the topic I'm going to end with today is wrapped around IRA planning. And the biggest changes that we've seen in IRA planning uh, are not proposed by Joe Biden. They happened. Uh, it was signed into law in 20, beginning of 2019 by President Trump. So the idea that only the Democrats will, will change uh, tax law that, that affect our clients is, is just not, not so. You know, there are going to be changes. They're, they're, they're going to continue to be changes regardless of the party that's in control. But really, this is one that has driven um, an enormous amount of discussion, conversation with our clients. And thankfully, you know, kind of brought a lot of people to the table from a planning perspective. So the SECURE Act was what what we, uh, we have, uh, what was passed and signed in 2019 that, that affected all these changes. So the first thing it did, and there's some benefits, but they, to pay for those benefits, they took away some things. So the first thing it did is it, uh, it changed the um, requirement distribution age, and it changed the ability for people to make contributions after that age. So it increased the requirement of distribution age from 70 and a half to 72. And it also enabled, as people were living longer, it enabled people, it kind of aligned it more with the foreign K rules to say, if you're still working, you can contribute to an IRA past 70 and a half, which was not the case before. So those are, those are okay. Um, it allowed long-term and part-time workers, which has become more of a commonplace in the US uh, to continue to participate in retirement plans. Uh, it offered change the options for income strategies, allowed some annuity things to be embedded into foreign K plans. Uh, it gave some some breaks to parents, allowing them to withdraw money from retirement accounts for birth and adoption of a child, qualified expenses, and it allowed some some ability to pull money 529 plans to shift uh, money uh, to pay student loans. But the most important thing that it did was it took away um, the stretch IRA. So under the Secure Act, the 
the stretch IRA, which many, many of our clients used as an opportunity to, to allow that IRA distribution to be spread over their children's life expectancy, really spreading out the tax and minimizing the impact, which we loved, um, went away. Uh, it also changed the ability for us to leave IRAs through trusts to our family members. So the first thing that it did is that, with some exceptions, uh, there's some exceptions with special needs children and minor children, but by and large, uh, an inherited IRA under the current law will require that the IRA be distributed to the beneficiary in a maximum of 10 years. So again, I went from a stretch, so maybe I'm a kid, I inherited an IRA and I've got a 40 year life expectancy and I could have spread that all over that time. Uh, now I got to take it out over 10 years, which typically will put you in a higher tax bracket and will increase the impact of tax on the IRA. Many families are worried about, even with a stretch, are worried about their kids getting an IRA and having the ability to cash it in. So they would flow their IRA into a trust at their death. And there were ways to write those trusts to enable that same sort of stretch provision from a required minimum distribution to, to mirror that. Secure Act took that away as well and required that a non, if it's a non-human beneficiary, a trust, that the IRA has to be exhausted in five years. Now that doesn't mean the trust has to pay it out, but the trust is gonna be paying higher income taxes, which it does anyway as an individual, but it's also gonna be in the maximum bracket every year. So again, when we put them side by side, could be pretty negative from an income tax perspective. Secondly, if you have clients, this is a great way to start the conversation with your clients. If you have clients that have trusts as their beneficiaries, they may have had something called a conduit provision which would say we're gonna get the requirement distribution, it's gonna come in and that, that small distribution is gonna flow out to the beneficiary. That needs to be changed if they're gonna to continue to have it because otherwise they're gonna get a fifth out each year for the five years. And that normally is, was not the intention to flow it through the trust. So great conversation starter. So uh, with all of this, this change in IRA planning, um, many, many clients have reached out, we've talked, we've, we've hosted some, some group discussions with our families. I've written about it. Um, and the idea was how do, we, how do we adjust our planning to continue to match the goals of the families and at the same time also try to minimize the impact of that. So uh, we, we started working in IRA maximization, which I'm gonna talk about. I think it'd be important to kind of walk you through a real client example so you can understand what the clients were thinking, you can understand their profile. Um, and then, you know, again, as we go along, if you have questions, feel free uh, either during this part of the discussion or at the end to ask. So in this example, husband and wife, they're out in Arizona. Uh, they're 61 and 62, recently uh, retired. Um, the state is 200 plus million, three children, five grandchildren. Um, so the key pieces to this is he has an IRA that they both openly say they do not need to fund their lifestyle. Uh, they had been, they had it flowing through a trust um, because they were worried about the children with regard to money. Um, so when this new Secure Act came into be, they were pretty unhappy about the fact that their all their plans were sort of uh, forcefully adjusted, if you will. Um, very strong believer that uh, income and estate tax will be higher in the future. And he, he and his wife wanted to use their unified credit that they had left uh, in 2020 because they also felt very strongly that uh, that ultimately is gonna go away in their lifetime. So we, we talked about a couple things. We talked about, do we do a Roth? Um, you know, do we pay the income tax now, create a Roth situation? And the math looks pretty good, you know, assuming, you know, in, in their case, they think estate taxes and income tax are much higher but it didn't solve the problem that they really wanted to control the assets for their kids. So we looked at this IRA maximization strategy a couple different ways. Um, so if you think about it, the first thing we talked about, if, you do, if you're doing a Roth, you're gonna, you're gonna pay the tax on the IRA in year one. So let's start with that being apples to apples between the two. So in this case, either through an annual distribution or a lump sum, we're gonna take money out of the IRA and we're gonna gift it to a trust. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, my button here. We're going to gift that to a trust. Um, and in this case, um, we decided to do a lump sum because you want to lock in the unified credit. So if you think about it, you take the IRA, you cash out the IRA, you reserve enough to pay the income tax, you take the balance, you gift that into a generation skipping irrevocable trust, 
for the benefit of the family. And I'll talk about the two different, two different methods that we did and what we did with that gifted money. Um, option one, you take that money and you fund a second to die joint, joint survivor policy for the benefit of the kids. Um, in this example, um, the money goes into the trust, it gets invested and you bleed the premiums out over a period of time. And um, you can either pick a death benefit or you can, you can maximize it, which in this case we did using the entire value to fund the life insurance, which creates tax-free value to generations two, three and beyond for the family. Option two was, although they had $200 million and although they didn't think they needed the life insurance, we did have the discussion to say, uh, if in the event that the husband were to pass, um, would he want to have a safety net for his wife? And so we looked at this on an individual basis using a SPAT um, that gave us the ability to transfer the cash using blocking the credit for the husband. We insured the husband's life and we made the wife the primary beneficiary of that trust. Now, for all intents and purposes, I don't see any scenario based on their spending and lifestyle that she would ever need that money, but it, but it is a safety net that there would be a bucket of money there. And I'll show you how the math works uh, between the two now. So I know this is a lot of numbers on the page. Uh, the key to it is, is you think about on the left side, you have the current plan. On the right side, you have the IRA maximization. Um, we actually did a third scenario where we did a current plan Roth and then that, but we eliminated the Roth idea because of the family wanted to control the assets for the kids. So if I have an IRA worth about $15 million, I'm going to have a state income tax on that IRA. I'm going to have a net to the heirs of about 4.9 million in year one. If I take that IRA and I, I put that into uh, the uh, trust, as I said, I'm going to pay about $5.7 million um, on in an income tax perspective, and I'm going to get a much higher net death benefit with the insurance. So in this case, what we've done is I've taken the IRA, and if I project this out to age 93, 94, which is beyond their life expectancy, it's a number we came to together, I'm going to end up net net in the current plan, assuming we pay the 10-year tax, assuming we invest it. In this case, you want to use a 5% return. We, 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 we can do it either way. Um, you can fluctuate that up or down. Uh, that the net result to the kids is about 23 million net net after tax under a current plan. If I looked at it in a joint basis, the net net return for the kids was 57 million because what I was able to do when I made the gift of the, the net after income tax IRA, we then take that out over 10 years and you pay 10 premiums, you bleed that down over 10 years, you have a 10 pay policy, fully funded, get you $57 million uh, in the plan. So in this example, $33 million difference for the family. In the scenario with the individual plan, same idea, same structure, same tax and growth assumptions, but the difference is we did an individual policy on the husband and we proposed it and, and we were able to uh, provide um, a, a pretty substantial increase as well. So in this example, same, same life expectancy, we were able to increase the value by about 16, just under 16 and a half million dollars comparatively. Um, so depending on the, the, the goals of the family, depending on their estate plan, both work. Um, and it's a great way to leverage that. What's also important, it was probably most important to this family was the assets that the children are gonna receive now are going to be the result of a death benefit. They're coming in income and estate tax free. Then they're gonna be held in trust for their benefit with, with distribution provisions, but their asset protected divorce, creditor protected for those, those, those children and their grandchildren, which was their primary goal. They, they were very much against giving the kids full access to very large lump sums of money um, in their estate. So which the IRA, we, 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 and by, by way of the SECURE Act change on how trusts receive IRAs, it really became an impossibility for them to meet that goal without a really big tax hit. Um, so from a, from a planning perspective, if you think about it, again, just to summarize, we've got the net of the heirs of trust in the current plan, this example, 23 million. On the joint life, uh, I get 2.4 times the benefit, about 33 million more to 57 million. Or on the individual, uh, we can get that up to uh, by 16 million uh, for two. And you can blend it. 
uh, you can do this into two different trusts. You can do some second to die, some individual, you customize that plan. Other thing to, to understand is you don't have to do the entire IRA. This is a great opportunity for families to take a part of their IRA. And, or, or, or if you have a husband and wife and each have one, there, there are ways that you can, you can pick, kind of like a Roth conversion, you can pick how much you want to do. Good idea to think about that as you go through the planning. And, and size really doesn't matter. This is a larger estate, but size doesn't matter either. Uh, it will work, um, work uh, in a number of ways. Um, and we think it's a, a fantastic way um, to, to generate, and for our, from a practice development perspective, it's a great way to generate insurance production. It's a great way to help families. And, and it really does make a lot of sense if they don't need the IRA for the funding of their lifestyle. Um, so to wrap up and before we get to questions and answer or questions and hopefully answers, uh, you know, some things to consider for 2020, um, election's going to happen. Hopefully we know in a short period of time who the, who, who the uh, elected uh, officials are going to be uh, from president all the way through Congress. Um, regardless of that, when you think about where we are toward the end of the year. So if, if we have um, a democratic control of the House and Senate and a president, let's take that extreme, uh, we got to really start to focus on capital gains harvesting, looking at the embedded gains in the states. How do we do that? Definitely in either scenario, we want to use the unified credit. Um, we want to maximize gifting uh, to the extent that you can. From an IRA planning perspective, have the conversations with your clients, review your beneficiary designations, talk about their goals, understand where they are, consider maximization if it makes sense for those families. And one thing I didn't talk about, but I want you to keep your ears and eyes open for. Uh, it's been written about, it's been mentioned, um, but one of the, the potential changes that didn't make it in the plan, but they're starting to talk about it is loss type matching. And this will affect all of us uh, as investors. Um, there is a discussion that um, under the Biden plan that they would create a scenario where losses would have to be tight match against gains. What I mean by that is I no longer could uh, sell a stock for a loss and use it against a gain in a piece of real estate or vice versa. That equity losses would, could only be used against equity gains and real estate losses or fixed assets. And, and so if that happens, that actually complicates even more of, of how we're doing it. We're calculating the, um, the net gain across all assets. So it, it makes uh, tax planning year in a little different, a little more difficult. So things to think about, keep your eyes and ears open for that. Um, you know, and, and the key takeaway, and I think from, from, from all the speakers that we've had over, over the period of this, this great conference, you know, the landscape's always changing. Um, think about those changes as an opportunity um, for all of us. Uh, have conversations with our clients, how to look at our practices, um, how, to, how to change and develop um, things that we may not have considered doing in our practices that under new regimes might make sense. You know, for, you know, I, I did it in, in, in our practice, adding the asset management side of the business was life-changing for us. Um, so as, as the world evolves, keep, keep an open mind. Um, you know, think about, you know, uh, you know, as I say, uh, I was very taken by Ben's opening conversation about the things to do before you die. So think about ourselves as, as, as people, we've all been locked in our houses and hopefully this will all be over soon, but, you know, we work really hard. We, we take care of our clients. We also make sure we take care of ourselves. And I think that's great. And, and having an opportunity to work with agency one, having an opportunity to engage with the carriers and having a team behind us, I think is really important. And I really thank Gonzalo and Kathy and Dennis and Ed for the years of the help that they've had me in developing my practice. And I just hope I gave you a little bit of an opportunity to uh, learn something today. Hopefully you take away one thing, uh, it'll be beneficial for you, but uh, we'll open it up now. I think the questions, I just saw Kathy pop up. That was amazing. Thank you. We've got a number of questions. Some uh, some are specific and some relate to you and your practice. So let's dig in. Uh, the first question up is, what do you recommend for families with significant real estate holdings if Biden wins and the step up in basis goes away? I think the first thing we have to see is one, does the, con you know, where does the Congress play out? But, but assuming we have what some call sort of uh, the democratic sweep, um, you'd have to first look at what their embedded gains are um, in each of those properties. And then, you know, from my view, the best thing to do is if they're income producing properties, you know, figure out a way to redirect some of the income to fund gifts to fund life insurance, because they're going to need 
uh, a bucket of liquidity um, uh, to fund those and life insurance is a perfect way to do it. Um, but we tend to, I do this a lot with families, we'll look at the income coming off the property, we'll figure out how much of that we'd have to, we'd have to transfer over to the, to the liquidity bucket page um, uh, to, to fund it. Okay, the next question that came in, can you address IRDs? Does that still exist? Uh, it has not uh, been clear, my guess is it will. So IRDs income and respect the decedent. So um, they haven't made it clear whether that deduction would still uh, apply. Um, so basically it prevents you from having to pay an estate tax on the portion that was paid in income tax. So, um, but my guess is yes, it, 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 the, the, that part of the system, I haven't read anything, uh, but I'll make a note, I'll make a note and research that. Thank you. Uh, regarding your specific practice, how do you engage families around the quote, preparing the wealth for the family mm -hmm. versus preparing the family for the wealth, end quote. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I rewatched uh, David York's piece uh, or this morning on the why of estate planning. So I think um, a lot of what we do, so I'll give you a couple of real world examples. So we have a family that I've worked with for about 20 years. We now have four generations. Uh, the patriarch passed away, matriarch still alive. We run for them functionally what they call a Florida family trust company, which is a private trust company. And over the years, as the grandchildren, now great grandchildren have begun to sort of come of age, we, we do a few different things. So, so each one of the grandchildren that are now out of school that are getting married, um, we have very specific individualized meetings just with them uh, to help them with the, to build a basic financial plan to, to sort of get them on the right path early to teach them about um, you know, managing their, their wealth and their assets from a, from a spending perspective. Um, the, the patriarch and matriarch of the family also taught me something I think is really good is they didn't wait till they, they were gone to share with their family their expectations. Um, we get together every year with this family, there's about 30 members of the family now with all the different layers, um, and we hold a big family meeting. And in that family meeting, it's evolved over time. We have an educational component um, geared toward different factions of the family. We have breakout meetings with different levels of the family. But one of the most interesting things that we've ever done with them, which has worked really well, is they have a large foundation. And uh, the grandfather who's now passed away said, I want my grandchildren to understand why we did this. So about 10 years ago, we, we assigned um, that the family has sort of four key components in the foundation. And he assigned a rotating role for each of the grandchildren to be in charge for a two year period of time of that section of the foundation. And what that meant was they had to go get active in the, in the, the benefactor, the charity. They had to take board representation. They had to come, come to the family and do a report they had to do things initiative and then so, so that got them involved and to see their evolution over time was amazing. And then what we also did is we carved out a bucket to allow the grandchildren to decide where they wanted that charitable money to go. So getting them involved early is really important, having proactive open discussions and most importantly, sharing very clearly and directly what 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 so say I'm the father. Our, my wife and I, our views of how our expectations are around the money. So there's no gray area. Um, I think that's really good. I also think structuring is good, you know, building in pr protections with, with uh, trust planning so that you can teach them, but you're also going to protect them at the same time. Another question that came in regarding your practice, uh, you provide a holistic, you provide holistic advice to your clients uh, from accumulation, decumulation, tax planning, and wealth transfer. Uh, for those advisors that are only in the wealth management business, how would you advise on their fiduciary obligation outside of just portfolio construction regarding beneficiaries? Uh, are there more business risks to not engaging in a more holistic approach? Um, I haven't, you know, I haven't seen any sort of legal action, at least in the industry around, you know, advisors getting in trouble for not you know, talking about planning, but what I say to the advisors that work for me, and I've got 16 advisors that work for, for, for me, is that the more you engage in planning, 
And the more that you engage with the families in areas outside of asset management, the more solid that client relationship gets. Because if you're only handling one thing and that doesn't go well or it's cyclical in investment management, you know, they may move on to the next person. But if you're handling their planning and you're their kids and you're doing all the work and you're proactive with them on a regular basis, that is invaluable to the family. So I think I don't see any, I haven't seen, I'm sure there is any lawyer can find legal risk. No, no joke, Kathy. I know Kathy's an esteemed member of the legal profession. Um, but the, the idea of it is, is you think about it proactively and say the more uh, deep we go with our clients, the wider the relationship comes, the better that relationship is to be with us for a very long period of time. So I want to I wanna look at that relationship more holistically, not just because it's good for the business, also great for the families. But what we found is the families where we have the deepest planning relationships are the best clients. Um, thank you, Bill. I do not see any other questions uh, that have come in. There's been a number of comments which uh, reinforce my opinion, which is, wow, Bill is a phenomenal speaker. Oh, wow, thank you. That's great. So, uh, you know, on behalf of Agency One, thank you. If anybody has any other questions that they can think of, please feel free to email us. We'll be sure to get in touch with Bill and, um, and pass them along. Bill, do you have a final slide with your yep. contact info? I do. There you go. All right. So um, reach out. And I, I, I do publish, if you're on our website, um, we publish as a firm, my partners and I publish a few different pieces, a couple on more on asset management and global economies, but I do one called Wisdom and Wealth. Uh, it's part of a book project I'm doing, it comes out once a month. You feel free to, to go on, past issues are on there, plus if you want to have it emailed to you, we're happy to do that as well. Uh, thank you, Bill. Again, I don't see any other questions. So um, uh, with that, I am going to do some final housekeeping items. Uh, please remember to fill out your surveys. They will be emailed to you sometime this afternoon. The 2020 Agency One Virtual Advisor Conference is now officially over. I would like to thank everyone for being here today and for their participation over the past month. I would like to thank again, all of our carrier sponsors for their support and for helping us to make this meeting possible. Again, a shout out to John Hancock, Prudential, Protective, Nationwide, Symmetra, Equitable, American General, Lincoln Financial Group, Principal, and Securian. On behalf of Ed Lesher, Dennis Bartos, Gonzalo Garcia, your case managers, your underwriting team, your advanced markets team, your case design and illustrations team, your commissions department, and everyone else from Agency One. We hope that the sessions, which all have been recorded for your convenience, have given you some takeaways that will help you grow personally and professionally. A special thank you to Lisa Mitchell and Lisa Perry for all of the behind the scenes work that was expended to put this month long virtual meeting together. They worked countless hours and, uh, and we believe they did a yeoman's job. This, this meeting is now officially over. We hope that you will reach out to Agency One if we can be of any assistance. We hope that you and your families remain safe and healthy throughout the holiday season and beyond. And again, thank you to everyone. Great. Thanks. We are now done. Bill, thank you. You're welcome.